So I, I think we're in a good position to begin. Um, so I'm going to say uh, welcome to Winter Views Series 1, Episode 2. Uh, I'm Catherine Silva, a dark fiction author from Maine, and today I'm joined by fellow New England author Rob Smales. Rob, how are you this evening? I'm okay. How are you? This is your third event. You must be tired. It's my third event, and I, I am tired, but I am very excited about our discussion as well, because this is a little more low-key, uh, relaxed, and, and I, I feel pretty chill going into this, so I am Good. excited. Um, I would like to start by just asking if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to our audience today, um, just by telling them a little bit about you and your work. Hi, I'm Rob, and I write stuff. <laughs> kind of it. I write the words that occur to me to write at the time. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm the author of uh, Friends in High Places, which is a um, uh, coming-of-age horror novella. Um, short story collection called Echoes of Darkness and a few dozen short stories I have floating around out there. Um, and my stuff has been described as a uh, slow build or slow burn, which is perfect because that happens to be our topic this evening. Mm -hmm. So, um, I believe you were, we, we shared an anthology this year as well, or the last year we shared an anthology uh, with the New England Horror Writers group. They came out with their Wicked Creatures anthology. Yes. And you had a particularly creepy, slow burn horror story in that anthology. That's fun. It was, it's very fun, but it was also really spooky. Um, so I yeah. thought I would start our, our topic this evening just asking you about how you were inspired to write that story. Oh, God. Um, what's that one? That one's Would You Love. Um, <laughs> they specifically asked in the call, it was, it was Wicked Creatures, and they wanted, um, hopefully, to have stories about not the regular, I mean, you could write a werewolf story or a zombie story, or, or but they were trying to avoid those things and, mm -hmm. and go with stuff that might be a little farther afield. And if you could send them to the books looking to try to figure out what you were writing about, all the better. Um, I actually wrote four stories for that. Oh, wow. Um, I couldn't get them to behave and stay small enough. Um, so I think, yeah, this is my fourth, my fourth shot at it, and it turned out to be uh, just a little bit under the submission hmm. requirements. Um, yeah, I tried, uh, I was, and for each story I tried a different creature. Nice. Um, and this was, I'm not sure how I settled on, uh, it's a dryad. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert, it's a dryad. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how I settled on that. Um, I just started writing and she happened. Mm -hmm. So. Yep. It was fun. That's how it goes sometimes. You know? Yes. Um. Yeah, it was um, it's particularly creepy. Definitely, I, I think, one of the creepiest ones in that anthology, in my opinion, anyway. So just really well-built tension. Um, good stuff. Um, you guys cool. should we're here. check it out. Um, and um, so I guess we'll start with our discussion. It, it is, we're talking about slow burn horror this evening. Um, slow burning horror is the opposite of that fast paced, mile a minute kind of horror. Um, slow burning horror ramps up the tension, lulling us into an uneasy calm before the real terror strikes. Um, slow burning horror is, I, I feel like it's having really having a moment right now um, there's a lot of examples in recent years of slow burning horror that has done really, really well. Um, a lot of the A24 films, including The Witch, Midsummer, uh, yes. It Comes at Night, 
hereditary those are all slow building horror um netflix's new have. series uh the archive 81 which i just finished the other night that is definitely slow burn horror um and then of course a bevy of horror literature that has come out uh like examples by stephen graham jones josh mallerman eric laroca uh paul tremblay and the two of us as it happens yes uh and many many more um so i'd like to start with talking about atmosphere in slow burning horror uh in your opinion how does the setting and the mood in a slow burning horror uh story differ from a fast-paced jump scare filled narrative um it's, it's it's kind of a matter of focus and speed um the jump scare stuff and 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 um it, with the term jump scare i tend to think of movies um and uh, i think of more uh, extreme horror with 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 writing um and both of those uh, the, the focus is more on kind of steering you it, it ramps up the tension, tries to keep you nervous, and, and tries to kind of direct you toward those jump scares or the squick scenes in, in extreme horror. Um, and that's, I have heard several people um, opining that, that, that with the, with the with the comeback of the novella, with the comeback of the slightly shorter mm -hmm. form, that horror yeah. works really well in that shorter form because you need you kind of need to get to the point. You kind of need to to build and build and then have the payoff, have the you know the big culmination scene, and then you're you're kind of done. Um, that is true of. Okay, it really isn't one or the other. Um, uh, there's there's slow burn stuff and slow build stuff at one end, and at the other end there is basically torture porn <laughs> um, that are so far apart, and, ev and everything is is falls somewhere in between. Uh, and the the closer you get to the torture porn end, the better it works with a shorter form, I think, because you're going for effect. Um, you're going for uh, just the term jump scare. It's it's quick. It's that happens. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with slow burn stuff, you need more you need more space. You need more room um, in order to to create that build. And uh, cer there's certain authors. I'm going to fall back on Stephen King, mm -hmm. who can't seem to write. I mean, his short stories are 75, 80, 90 pages long, and they're still calling them short stories compared to, this is compared to everything else that he's writing. Um, and he's still doing it and still uh, horribly viable mm -hmm. uh, as, as a writer. Um, and his stuff is definitely not short. Yeah. It's definitely not quick. Um, but it is definitely slow paced, slower burn, bigger build, mm -hmm. um, because that's what he's good at. Um, so yeah, the atmosphere. Yeah. What did I? Um, I, I keep relating things to movies because. It, mm, mm, most people have seen uh, there's a greater overlap there's fewer movies than there are books and there's a greater overlap for for things and for jump scare stuff i fall back on like uh scream yeah. the original not the one that just came out yep um because that like red, red out of the gate boom had the scene where they killed what you thought was going to be the biggest star in the film mm -hmm. and she's gone 
sorry, it's a spoiler alert. It's 25 years old. Get over it. Um, <laughs> and then it builds. It, it, you have a little bit of getting to know the characters, and then it, it it starts to roll and just stays there. Yeah. Right up until the end, and it just maintains all the way through, and it's it's moving at a run. Um, and it works. It really does. And that's kind of the complete opposite of a slow burn. Mm -hmm. um, and at the at the other end of that, you're going to have stuff like uh, oh, I just mentioned it when it was on Netflix, the uh, Midnight Mass. Oh, Midnight um, Mass, yeah. That yeah. I forget how many episodes it was, but it was hours and hours long. It was and eight it, or nine, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's eight or nine hours long, and it's one basically it's one continuous story, and there was some tension to it, um, but there was an awful lot of character building, an awful lot of getting to know people, and an awful lot, an awful lot of um, us really becoming attached to certain characters mm -hmm. and thinking of them as people and until you get to the end and i don't want to spoil this one because it's not 25 years old <laughs> but that, it, yeah not everybody makes it um and and that was just as much fun as as screen mm -hmm. but um it just took four or five times as long yeah well I, um i had i thought of this um this simile earlier and, th and that's that slow burning horror is like marinating a steak um you can you can obviously throw the steak in the pan and um sear it and and then pull it out and that's good too but marinating a steak takes time to develop all the flavors you get a complex taste that is in essence what slow burning horror is too um yes. you're just getting you're developing more flavors um so moving on from atmosphere um i would like to talk about dread versus horror um dread is using an uneasiness and an uncertainty to cause steadily building terror um one of my favorite movies that utilizes dread is jaws in that oh, yeah. it just really 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 keeps you uh keeps ramping up the uneasiness by never really showing you what the thing is that's killing people yeah and um but also like letting everybody kind of run around and um react to it and that's that's the kind of horror i just really love um so in terms of dread versus horror um what's your your take on that like what is your um your favorite kind of dread in stories usually it's uh it is the kind where you know something's wrong it is like jaws you know something's wrong but you don't exactly know what it is and you can't really see it coming sometimes you don't even know really what it is mm -hmm. you just know that there's something out there the um uh, friday the friday the 13th the first movie mm. before he became an action superstar <laughs> um you didn't see the killer in fact and this is even more than 25 months this, this this is like 35 years old something um it, it wasn't even jason in the first movie it was his mom mm. and uh but you never saw her you never saw the killer um you saw the kills and uh too much a, a lot of stuff happened off screen and you were aware of it and you're aware that there was someone out there but you didn't you couldn't see them coming um the uh the ring for a while the ring was my favorite scariest <laughs> movie. i made a mistake of watching it 
in the family room in the basement by myself, and it was stupid. Um, with that one, that was it was rated PG thirteen, and it was is it? Friggin- yes, it was oh. because everything happened off camera. You didn't actually see anyone oh. horrifically killed. You just got to see the after effect. You got to see people reacting to it, um, which which, as far as I was concerned really worked because it scared the shit out of me yeah. um I, yeah the the stuff where you can't see it coming and you have to imagine um the stuff that i find a lot more frightening mm-hmm. um than if i can see something coming a uh, ghost stories scare the hell out of me a lot more than werewolf and vampire i i yeah. like uh, I, I like werewolf stories. I've read werewolf stories. Um, I like werewolves as a as a character, as a thing, as a as a problem. Um, but honestly, if I were going to have to square off against something, I'd rather be able to see it. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, that's just how my head works. Yeah, that's. I think that's how a, a lot of people's heads work. Uh, just that um, the imagination, the human imagination, is so powerful that um, when you don't have uh, like constraints, when you don't have something that you can visualize, um, I think it makes it that much more terrifying in, when you're watching something or reading something because um, you don't, you're not able to explain it away. It's not like something rational. So you're what? you're just sort of focusing on what it could be um and your mind runs away with you and um it just it is 10 times scarier <laughs> not yeah, knowing if, what the thing if is if you're filling in the blanks you're filling the blanks in with the thing that scares you the most yes yes Which if, if you're a writer or a movie maker or, or any kind of a storyteller and you're trying to define it for someone, you might, pers- for them personally, miss the mark. But if yeah. you leave it, you leave it up in the air and let them fill in the blank, they're going to do a whole bunch of the work for you. Um, I, right. I think a movie that really utilizes this tool well is It Follows. In that, the the thing, whatever the thing is, the curse. Mm-hmm. could be anything and its sole purpose is to just follow the person um, who is at you know the top of the list and use whatever means it can to follow that person until they catch up to them and kill them yeah and and it could be anything it like it there is um, it changes its form several times through the film, and um, and that that just was a brilliant thought to me. I I really liked that. It's, it's got an unstoppable quality, and you can't see it coming. Yeah. Um, there's a uh, there's an Australian there's an Australian zombie movie. Um, that that implacableness that that it follows had where you you can you can run but you can't rest because it's going to catch up with you yeah. um uh armageddon road something road armageddon mm-hmm. road might have been armageddon road um they, uh, it, there were two brothers who were out hunting and one of them got bit by a zombie and he got turned and he was a zombie mm-hmm. and started chasing his brother and so they're they're going through the forest and it's a shambling zombie he's coming after him um and he could he, he could outrun him but he gets tired and the mm-hmm. zombie doesn't and it goes all night long until it's morning and the the he, the still living brother is just exhausted yeah and and can't and he's been miles ahead of the of the thing but they he's never been out of sight yeah and eventually it catches up with him and they have to, he has to fight it. Yeah. And it's that, it's that whole, he can't get away. 
which that was terrible. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was probably the worst part of the movie for me. I liked that movie. <laughs> but that that one part, he was isolated, he was alone, and he could not get away, no matter how hard he tried. It was great. <laughs> I'll have to remember that one to check out. Um, I think, let's see here, I want to find in my notes. Um, so I had listed a few um, slow horror novels that I read in the last year. Um, and I wasn't sure if you had read any of these, but um, I finished... I think about a month ago I finished reading Ronald Malfi's Come With Me, which is a ghost story, but it is a slow burning ghost story. I have it, but I haven't started. Okay. Um, I also put down The Only Good Indians by uh, Stephen Graham Jones, yes. uh, Bird Box by Josh Mallerman, and yes. Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay. Yes. Um, all is just being really really good character driven slow burn horror novels yes um and i wondered if you you had any that you had read recently that you might add to that um i just <laughs> uh i just started i listen to audiobooks at work all the time um and i listen to them at boston speed which is at least one and a half speed maybe up to two depends on mm -hmm. who the narrator is okay um so I, I kind of tear through them. And this morning I started, it's a reread, um, but it's uh, Pet Cemetery. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I, because this was coming up tonight, I was struck by the fact that I am a little over 25% through the, the book already, mm -hmm. um, which it's a 425 page novel. So if you like take out table of contents and uh steve talking to his constant reader at the beginning i'm mm -hmm. about 100 pages in the story so that's a, like a full novella basically and 90 percent of the stuff that that people think of when you mention pet cemetery hasn't happened yet um mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, again it's a 40 year old <laughs> so yeah you know, i spoilers um the a gauge hasn't died or come back church hasn't come back yet mm -hmm. i just got to the part i'm like a quarter of the way through it and they uh they just got back from the micmac burial ground and but it's been great mm -hmm. so far all of the other stuff that's happening um they move into the house they get to know the crandles who live across the street the old couple mm -hmm. um the, it, they visit the pet cemetery not the mcnat not the mcnat burial ground but the, just the regular pet cemetery and it freaks the little girl out and the mother's upset about that and the father's upset because the mother's upset and it's it's nothing supernatural about this supernatural horror story and it's regular like life tension of the stuff that happens in a family um and when it gets to the point that stuff does start happening mm -hmm. um f like fairly the the description of um god, uh, what's his name uh god damn it the guy who dies the kid who winds up on victor oh. i just listened to it I yeah. him horrible oh. names. when when um the, the the college kid dies that's graphic and horrific and and it's squicky. I like that word. <laughs> but, it but it doesn't really bother me because we didn't know him at all. Yeah. And then about 20, 25 pages later, Mrs. Crandall has a heart attack. She lives. He saves her. She winds up on medication. And the doctors tell her she's probably going to be healthier now than she was before she had the heart attack because now she's on medication. So it was actually a good result. Mm -hmm. But that scene, because I had just spent... 85 pages getting to know her um hurt it bothered me yeah and it's not it, that that's when um when people talk about the book or the movie or no one mentions her at all yeah she's not she hasn't stuck in their heads all of that stuff's still coming that's why i like slow burn stuff yeah 
<laughs> it, it's, it's makes you more, care. It's more affecting. Yeah, you care about everybody and everybody's yes. relationships with everyone. You get the more more of a full rounded experience, I think. Um, so when we come down to uh, slow burn horror, a lot of them are character driven narratives. So part like second part of our discussion was going to be about um, character uh, development in slow burning horror um, and the harmony between the two. Um, and we were just, you know, you were just talking about the better chance to, you get a better chance to know the characters when you are able to sit down with them for a long period of time. They become yes. very multifaceted and it's easier to relate to them, um, to and, empathize and with them. Whether you're a, a, a character-driven writer or a plot-driven writer, it, that, that doesn't matter because the, the, the fact that you're spending so much time with the characters means that even if they didn't intend it, even if they didn't write it that way, um, that they were, you know, very, very plot driven when they were writing it down, the reader, or if it's a movie, the audience experience is, becomes very character driven because mm -hmm. they're spending so much time with them. So it's kind of, it's built in. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, uh, and it's the only way that it's going, it's the only way that it's going to work. Yeah. If you don't, if the characters aren't developing, if they're just kind of staying flat, yeah, then you lose the reader, you lose the audience, and when the stuff, when you finally get to the bad things happening to them, the squicky part, um, <laughs> you kind of you lose it. It's it's more like you reading about something hor something horrible happening to someone in the news. Yes, it was horrible, but you didn't really know them, as yeah. opposed to the same thing happening to a family member. Yeah, where. It, it shatters you. Um, so yeah, the only yeah. way it's going to work, any kind of any kind of good, slow build stuff, the character development is kind of it, it has to be built in. Yeah. Um, so Carol actually just asked a question in the, in the chat. Um, okay. Do you guys feel they all have to be likable characters in a oh, slow burn no. horror? And that, yeah, no, they don't have to be. Um, certainly not. <laughs> I mean, first of all, no one is going to, I think, totally relate to somebody that is all good um, or um, sort of follow them or want to follow them around i think the more realistic they are the the better yeah. they they have to be flawed and sometimes it's um sometimes part of that development as you're spending time with the character can be you start out no you do not like them they are not likable they are you're kind of hoping you can't wait until they die, yeah. and then you spend you spend enough time with them and realize uh, you wind up realizing why they're like that, or um, uh, you don't necessarily <laughs> you don't necessarily come around to liking them, but you might understand them a little bit. Yeah. Um, so you still wind up with the with kind of a connection for them, and maybe you're rooting for them, maybe. Uh, this guy's an asshole, but <laughs> you're hoping, you're still hoping that he can turn it around, not be an asshole. He's going to therapy, whatever. Um, and then when it gets, when when the, the bad part happens to him or her or them, um, you were hoping for them, whether they were, you know, jackasses or not. You yeah. were feeling hopeful for them, even a little bit, and that kind of helps lock you into, oh, that's too bad when something bad happens. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's um, what I was thinking too. Um, I think, um, of course, it just flew out of my head the moment that I started to speak. Isn't that a wonder? All right. Um, is that 
no one is is usually inherently all evil. Um, everybody has their own reasons for doing something. So there there is definitely a chance in slow burning horror to to get to know everybody. Like you were saying, you learn something about them that makes you understand them more. Um, and even if you don't like them, um, you know, even if it doesn't totally redeem them, then no. they're, at least you still know them a little bit better. I just, this, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to try not to spoil this because it's new. Um, before Pet, before Pet Cemetery, I read, um, The Last House on Needless Street. I needed to look oh, yeah. up the title. Um, I just finished that this morning. Um, I haven't read it yet. And the, have you, have you read it? I, I have not read it. It's on my bookshelf, but I, I haven't yeah. gotten to it yet. Uh, things I love about it. It has, it's, it's really simple language. Um, because at various points of view, some of it, it's from the point of view of a child. Um, so it's from the point of view of a cat. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the, the, it's not, there's no highfalutin language in it, but it's, it's still the most complex story. Mm -hmm. And you will not like the, I guess he's a protagonist. He's the main, mm -hmm. the main point of view. Um, and he's just, you're fairly certain he's the villain. He's the villain. Hmm. Um, you probably won't hate him the whole time. Um, and it, it is, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a visceral dislike. She creates, uh, he, yeah, he's very unlikable. He's horrendously unlikable. He's also horrifically flawed and she uses all of that. It's it's a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. And now I I'm sorry that I brought it up because now <laughs> I, it's so much stuff that I I want to say, and it's it's not no. 35 years old, and I don't want to yeah. I don't want to spoil it for anyone. Um, but if 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 you have read it out there, you know what the hell I'm talking about. If you haven't, read it. Yeah. It's the last house on Needless Street, Kidder. Again, I'm so terrible with Catri names. Catriona Ward. Catriona Ward. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's really good. <laughs> it was really good. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's how I feel about uh, "Come with Me" by Ronald Malfi, and that's okay. uh, that is a like top tier best like top five books I've ever read kind of deal. Um, and, and I've heard a lot of good things about, uh, Katriana Ward's book. So I'm, and that's why I bought it. I just, my to be read pile is so large. Um, yeah. the, basically that bookshelf that is behind me and to my left is filled with books that I have not read. And then there's one over here and there's one over there. And it is also, both are filled with books that I have not read. It's a bad I, situation. Yeah, no, no, my physical stack here in this place is not very large, um, but I do have uh, one, two, three, four, five, five bookcases full of stuff oh, yeah. that I haven't read yet. Yeah. Um, double stacked, you mm -hmm. know, front paperback fit front to back. You can double, you can double yeah, up. Yeah, it's um, hard, so isn't it? To, to, the shelves look like this now. They just. Yep. Going from the way of the books. Yeah, you can um, see in the the one behind me. It's they're they're definitely yes. Boeing. I will get to them. It's so much fun, isn't it? Being yes, just book obsessed. I will get to them. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm gonna flip over my paper here, um, so we can get to our. We're actually to the wrap up point of the show. To the uh, the wrap up questions. Um, okay. 
So the, my first wrap-up question for you is, what is your favorite kind of slow burn horror? Um, I had listed psychological, art house, gothic folk. There's there's a number of different kinds of horror that can be slow burn. Yeah, some of those I don't even know what they are. I don't even um, know what art house is. I just saw it and I was like, okay. and I was like, oh, that's cool. Does that mean it, yes. it's artsy? Um, I'll put it down. I I think. Um, I think I like supernatural and and psychological the best. Um, I I enjoy someone going mad. Yeah. Um, my, like my favorite it's short my favorite story too. is the uh, the Telltale Heart. That guy yeah, bats so you out of his good. head the whole time, um, and and determined to convince you that he's not, which is just that's a tell right away. When someone leads off with, I'm not crazy, but mm -hmm. they're crazy. Um, I, I, yeah, I do like, um, I do like stories where someone, hopefully, um, the, the, the narrator is losing their mind or has lost their mind mm -hmm. and is hiding it well until they're not. Yep. Um, I, I, in, I don't know why, but I enjoy the hell out of that. Yeah, me too. Um, and so supernatural stuff because well, like I enjoy a good serial killer story um, mm -hmm. that, except that I can turn on the news and find that that's, yeah. that's real and uh, sometimes I can get burned down on it because in the world we live in you can't get away from it sometimes mm -hmm. um, whereas if I'm reading a vampire story or ghost stories, I can put it down and I'm not in that anymore. So that's actually, that allows it to be a distraction. Hmm. Um, and a good mashup where you have like a serial killer vampire, that's good too. <laughs> um, those are fun. Especially if they can make it, um, well, like, like, Midnight Mass that mm -hmm. was fairly realistic um, because it wasn't because a lot of it wasn't necessarily the vampire it was people reacting to stuff mm -hmm. and uh, that's real that's the kind of thing you can see yeah. every day um, and then you slip a supernatural element in there and A it makes it it makes the supernatural element seem more real because everything else is, but it also kind of takes the sting out of everything else being so damned real yeah. that it's depressing. Yeah. Because now it has a highly fictional element yep. in it. Um, and it, it balances out. And they did that in that show. Mm. Yeah, they did a really good job in that show. Yes. Um, yeah, psychological that dude, horror is... That dude's from here. <laughs> he is? Yeah, he was born in Salem. Oh. Huh. He lived in Salem, Massachusetts. He lived in, I think, eight or something, and then he moved away. Huh. Um, but originally, originally he's from my hometown. So, That's yeah. pretty awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it has nothing to do with me, but I don't care. Hey, it's good. exciting. Yeah. It's exciting. Um, yeah, I, I think psychological horror is probably one of my favorite types of horror to read, to watch, and to write. Um, and I definitely like the idea where you don't know if the character is actually going nuts or if there is, um, you know, everything is actually happening. Yeah. And um, one of my earliest run-ins with this was actually in a video game form. And I don't know if you play or not. Um, a lot of people don't. But uh, the game Silent Hill is a pretty, well, I would say 1999 is about when it came out. Um, Raccoon City. Raccoon City is actually Resident Evil. Is it Resident Evil? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, uh, which one was Silent Hill? Silent I... Hill is actually the name of the town is Silent Hill, um, and it is a psychological horror game 
where the, a lot of people more recognize the second one versus the first one. The second one is about this guy who gets a letter from his dead wife who's telling him to come meet him in their place, which is at this like motel that they used to go to in uh, this town called Silent Hill, which is uh, based after a real town in Pennsylvania where ash keeps falling from the sky <laughs> um, all the time. And, um, and so he goes on this journey to find his dead wife and through the story you're um, you're catching remembrances of what his relationship was like with her and he's running into all these monsters on his way and these really depressed people uh, with their own problems that he's trying to solve um, and it's just a really really well done game and pretty uh, god it came out Geez, almost 20 years ago, I think, at this yeah, point. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I, I played the original Silent Hill. I had to look it mm -hmm. up. Um, I had to look it up. Basically, I just Googled Silent Hill babies. <laughs> Those little, little shit-wielding assholes, right? The ones that... <laughs> the, okay. So, Silent Hill. We used to have a, a parrot. An African gray parrot that uh, apparently it had been a rescue and it had been abused by a man, and so it did not oh. like men. It hated me. Um, we'd stay inside the cage. Do the door was open. They could get out if they wanted. Mm -hmm. But it was stay inside the cage when I was home and my wife was not. And so I got home from work and I was going to play the game. Yeah. And the parrots inside. <laughs> okay, fine. Everything's yeah. great. Um, I had a, a my game playing chair was basically just a shaped like foam sponge basically kind of shaped like a chair um and i was so i was playing and what is it the, the it was so long ago but the siren goes off and you go into the first place yeah. where you're going to find those damned babies yeah and i went in so it's all kinds of creepy it's all kinds of dark and i'm on the this big tv in front of me i'm on the chair and i'm leaning forward and i'm barely on the edge of the chair because I keep switching forward a little bit because I keep thinking I can see better if I get closer right? yeah it gets no, really dark but, and then I went in and just as I went in to, I went through the door it goes to black because they're doing a scene change it comes back and there is a zombie baby shitting me in the back of the leg and the parrot I was so in the game I didn't realize that the parrot had come out of the cage gotten on top of it and was watching me and chose that moment to do one of those big loud rock noises that they do. Oh, God. I about shit myself. Jeez. My, my feet shot up, the controller shot up in the air, <laughs> and I wound up sitting on the floor in front of my game playing chair. Oh. And the parrot was quickly climbing back down into the cage and pulling the door closed with its mouth so that I couldn't get in to get it. Um, yeah, fun game. Oh, my God. I had a heart attack. Yeah, that like would be pretty, game. pretty scary. Yes. God. <laughs> yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I could see where that one would stay with you for a while. Yeah. No, I, I used to play lots of stuff and I, I stopped because, um, if I'm, if I'm playing something, I get too much into it and like, that's all I want to do. Yep. And I have way too much other stuff I need to do. Yep. That's my problem too. So yeah, I had to adult. Yep. It's, um, like, I, I'm at the point now where I, I take very long breaks. Like, I will play it for one weekend, and then I won't play it again for, like, another three weekends. <laughs> Just because there's too much going on. But, yes. I still love to play because I think it's another really good, um, way to experience horror. It is. Very interactive. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, so moving on from your, your terrifying parrot horror. That was great. Um, <laughs> and, uh, my second question is, um, you mentioned before that you have written a lot of slow burn horror. Is that, do you enjoy writing slow burn horror more than other kinds of horror? Um, 
I don't. I want to say I don't think I can help it. Um, in case you can't tell, I'm a talker. Mm-hmm. When I get once I get going, and I write the same way, and um, I wind up. I want to feel I need to explain stuff, and so when I'm writing the explanations, I'm think I'm other stuff's occurring to me, and so I wind up writing longer and longer stories. Mm-hmm. And in them, I'm writing about the characters. Um, some of it has nothing to do with the story at all, and winds up being cut. But um, yeah, I wind up doing stuff like you said that um, I'm forgetting my own damn title. I do it all the time. <laughs> um, uh, Would you love mm-hmm. you know, from Wicked Creatures? Was yeah. kind of it was sort of a slow build story mm-hmm. but it was less than 3,000 words yeah I can't and and that was me writing as short as I could at the time yeah. I used to um, I spent two years writing f- a flash fiction or two every week um, wow. just trying to keep it to a thousand words just to learn how to write short mm-hmm. and then I stopped doing that and um, people have suggested I write longer stuff so I started working on longer stuff and now I, I lost it I can't write the short stuff anymore. oh yeah so so now everything is slower you know Um, my opinion though is even even when you're writing the stuff that you know you're you're just you're developing those characters and and you assume that it's stuff that no one else needs to to read um like you, you get to a point where you're, they're like having a conversation about what cereal they're gonna have for breakfast, yeah. um, because it's building those characters. But in a sense, it's it's really a writing exercise because it's still it's good for you. You're you're learning those characters as you're writing them, um, even if that doesn't make it into the final draft. It's right. still work being done. So that's my justification, because <laughs> I do the same thing. And, um, and I still have it all. Yeah. So uh, maybe it'll come out in something else. Yeah. You never know. People yeah, like that, that uh, the extra, you know, behind the scenes stuff. I've got, t- I've got uh, the uh, first thing I ever wrote. I was forty. I didn't start this until I was forty. Um, the first thing that I ever wrote wasn't horror. It was a terribly hokey, shitty rom-com short <laughs> based around a scene that I had in my head um, that uh, no one will ever see while I'm alive. No, 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 nice. one, no one has ever seen this. Under lock um, and key. And, yeah, but I still have it, is the thing. Um, and it's one of those... Someday I'll die and they'll crack my computer open and say, what, what's this? <laughs> nice. Um, and look at the, they'll look at the date and go, oh, this must be one, like one of his, oh, this is shitty. And yeah, it is. It's terrible, but I still have it. I think we all do that. Like, yeah. I, I've got, oh, man. Yeah. I, um, my first story that I wrote for a creative writing class was about a master thief who was also a pianist so he would he would go to people's houses and play piano but then also steal their stuff so it made no sense at all and no one is ever going to see it but see uh but Smuggling i'm still going to keep it the piano. yeah like yeah. okay it just happens to go to these people's places and they're missing stuff afterward that's not suspicious at all no not horror either but just yep uh, not, stays not with everything you has to be not everything has to be horror um it's true but horror is more fun uh, Ooh. It usually when i um when i started my son was six um and I started, uh, uh, 
when I do public readings, I'm told that I read really well and, and um, that I'm, I'm a lot of fun. And I learned to do that by trying to keep my, I was trying to, I was trying to encourage my son to be a reader while competing with television, computers, everything else. Mm -hmm. And so he had story time until he was old enough to tell me to stop. Nice. Um, and for a while, I, I, there's a science fiction series that I wrote for him, um, mm. basically starring him. Uh, Very cool. Sort of, it's a version of him. Um, that was also, it's terrible. It was good for a six-year-old, but yeah. it's, it's terrible. Um, and I remember at one point he was going to, I wasn't there for this, I was told later on. He went to do something for school and was going to bring these stories in to do a project on. Oh. And when he went back to read them, he realized that they were like huge, they were big gaps um, because I don't write quickly. So occasionally I wouldn't finish tonight's oh. episode. Yeah. Or, and so I would start out reading it to him and then I would get to the blank page and just be telling it to him. Yeah. And then the next night pick up where I had left off in the telling. Mm -hmm. And so there's huge gaps in the story. And he was, he was like, hey, didn't even finish. Not on the page, but I finished him in my head. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so cool. That's really neat. So he has them, well, we have them somewhere. They're nice. Them. Yeah, that's, that's another one. Definitely never get rid of that. That's, that's really special. Um, so I, um, I think we're, we're actually at the end of our program. Um, okay. I would like, uh, I'd like our audience to know where they can find more about your, your books and you, um, do you have a website and uh, social media that you would like to share with? That's the really readers? easy. It's robsmales.com. Okay. Look no spaces. R O B S M A L E S dot com. Dot com. Um, okay. That'll that'll get you to my website where it has. Oh Christ! I've listed. I think every short story I've ever written is in there. Wow. No, every short story I've had published is in there. Not the, not everything. It would be a lot longer if it was everything I've written. Um, and way more embarrassing, too. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'm on Facebook, and again, it, I, I'm not the Rob Smales who lives in Germany. Okay. For... There's, a Rob, there's a Rob Smales who lives in Germany who oddly uh, also writes, but he's a yeah. translationist. He doesn't, he doesn't do fiction. Um, he writes English to German translations. Huh. For things. So. I feel like there has been a mix-up between you two before, now that you, like, have said that. Really? Oh. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't begin to say how many Catherine Silvas there are in the world and, uh, how many have found my author page and have liked it with that, like, oh, it's the same person that has my name. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna like this page. Um, yeah. it happens. It's funny. No, he hasn't. He hasn't found me yet. Uh, I, I found him by accident. Ah. Uh, well, I mean, if if he's the only other one. I think he is. Yeah. We'll see. I don't know. Might be worth connecting. Um, cool. So um, I'm going to say thank you for joining me this evening, Rob. Uh, this thank you was, for me. This was a lot of fun. And I almost don't want this to end because I had so much fun talking with you. Um, but I am going to end it because I'm also very tired. I'm very and tired. <laughs> this is your third one. Mm. Yes. Um, lots of lots of talking. Um, yes. And my throat is a little burned out. Um, but um, uh, so thanks again for and thank you for all of the various video calls that we've had to do in order to make sure that we could both see and hear each other because that was that's a whole other story for people in the chat there have been like numerous video calls between the two of us just to make sure that we could actually 
record and and see each other. Um, but it but all I worked do not out. Have the best history with technology. Well, I don't either. So this was so. at least it, it worked. It was good. It worked. It did work. Um, so nothing to do with me. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I was the problem, up. really. Um, and um, so. Uh, so thanks everybody who came to the chat this evening. Uh, you were very animated. Uh, it was nice seeing your chats scroll up through the screen, um, seeing the things that you had to contribute. And um, I will ask if you would like to join us next week. We do have another winter view scheduled for next Thursday, the 27th at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, with, and I'm going to butcher his name because I've never heard his last name spoken. Is it John Buha or Buja? Do you know? I butcher it too. So, um, I, I think I have said Buya before and I, but I don't think that's it. I think it's, I think it is. And John, John is in the chat. Um, so I feel even worse for not knowing. So this is why I need to know before. It's Booyah. Okay. It's Booyah, which is even more awesome. Awesome. Um, so now I know for next week so that I don't mispronounce your name. Um, to our chat next week with John Booyah about forest horror, which I'm very excited about, which kind of goes with your story uh would you love a little bit um kind of yeah yeah um i could do tree research for that which is fun that's very well fun and, and scary at the same time um but i i hope you all join us for that conversation next week um until then we'll be signing off um i hope everybody has a good evening and we will see you then. And have Cool. A good night. <laughs>